So I had talked about inverting the derivative somewhere. There we go. So I talked about inverting the derivative right here. It's these orange circles, which is why we get a free antiderivative with every derivative we, that we get. Uh, I want to talk a tiny bit more about this. So basically what we did is on the left side we have an equation that's the derivative of ln x equals 1 over x. So I'm talking about this part right here. So a derivative of ln x equals 1 over x. That's the same thing. We just move the derivative function to the other side uh, right there. There is a slight problem, and the problem is the derivative function is not 1 to 1. And of course, the only way you can invert a, fu a function is if it is 1 to 1. So there's not really a direct inverse derivative. There is an antiderivative, but it, you have to have the plus c. So we think about a derivative as a function. So if So if the derivative of capital F is little f, that also means that the function plus a constant, the derivative of that is also little f. So if c is 0, 1, or any, any constant number, the derivative is still just little f. So this right here tells us that the derivative is not a 1 to 1 function. There's an infinite number of choices whose derivative is little f. They're all different by a constant. And so when we talk about the inverse derivative or the antiderivative, we would write, let's see, what's the best way to write it? So I'm just rewriting with ddx notation here. If I move the derivative to the other side, Now, of course, this is bad notation to use. We'll clean it up in a second, but that would be one way to write it. You would mean what I know if you saw that, hopefully. That means the inverse derivative, which of course we don't write like that. We write as integral f dx. That's how we properly write the antiderivative. So I did something kind of sneaky here. I didn't take the derivative of one function. I took the derivative of one function plus any constant that you want. So if you take a more uh, an abstract algebra class, what I did is I took a derivative of an equivalence class of functions, which is one way of saying I'm going to group together every function that is just like f but off by a constant. So every function that is either the same curve as f or shifted up or down has the exact same derivative. So if you think about a derivative operating on equivalence classes, it is a one-to-one -one function. So that's just a little aside for the actual derivative operator is not one-to-one, -one, which is why when you do the antiderivative, you get a plus c. So it comes back to um, a function, but it could be off by a constant. None of that is necessary at all for Calc 2. That's just if you go somewhere in your senior year as a math major, you would look at uh, more abstract things like this. Now, you won't really know if you want to be a math major or not until you've taken probably through Calc 4 and then assess how you feel at the end. And if you really like if you really don't like spending late nights in the uh, lab trying to make your robot walk or your drone fly or whatever you're trying to do and you realize you don't want to be there at midnight four day days a week, um, then you switch to be a math major basically because you don't have to make anything work. Uh, in the real world, it's just all about the ideas. So that's how I knew I want to be a math major. I was going down the engineering route and I didn't like the engineering classes anymore.
I'm turning your TVs off, although that one went back on. Oh, that's good enough. Wait. Ah, eh, whatever. It'll be too hard. If you want to flip it off, go for it. We're probably just going to make the other <laughs> professors upset. It was just distracting when I turned this way. Uh, what was I working on? Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure those came out yet, but. No. I think we were working on horses or something. Horse. I don't know. Horse. Uh, horse, horse pulled cart <laughs> back when I went to school. That was a, the wheel was kind of a big deal. Um, I can't remember. I mean, it was some type of robot that I wasn't super into. Those, you know, like those cheap dog mechanic toys, like they walk around. Like, so cool. Yeah, I think I just made the decision to just take a zero on that assignment and take my B in the class and go on. <laughs> Or, I don't know. Maybe I did the other parts of the project, like all the written parts, and let everybody else do the mechanical parts. Um, so we got tangent. All right. So let's go on to the next one, which is obviously cotangent. We just did tangent. We're going to do cotangent next. So that's almost just like tangent, except it's the reciprocal. So this one should actually be even a little easier than the uh, tangent. It'll be almost exactly the same process. So go ahead and get the antiderivative here and try to clean it up at the end so you don't have that negative 1 hanging around. Actually, we won't have a negative 1 this time. So I'll give you a minute to knock this one out. Almost the exact same process.
You should get ln of absolute value sine x plus c. We didn't have any negative one to worry about, so we didn't have to do anything else really after this. Uh, oops. So any questions? So now we're going to do secant. So what I want you to do is try and fail. So I want you to try to integrate this, and you're not going to be able to. So give it a shot. All right, so what's the problem? We, don't have a negative, we, have a sign. we have no sign, basically. So there's no way to get the, uh, you know, basically the dx part out of there and put a du in its place. So unfortunately, this not going to work right here. So what we're going to do is multiply by something that there's really no way we would ever guess what it is that we're going to multiply by. Uh, so we're not even going to use cosines at all, so we're going to skip that. Now I don't feel like flipping the page to my notes of what we should multiply by, but I think I remembered. Now why is this a legal move to just multiply by this number? Because it's one. It's the only number you're allowed to multiply by uh, and not change things. Uh, now, my motivation for multiplying by it should be very mysterious. There should be no reason right away to think that this would be a smart thing to multiply by. What would be a reasonable choice for you? So think about our antiderivative. I'll zoom out a little bit. Our antiderivative formula, 
I basically need my u in the denominator. So with that knowledge, what is a good choice for u here? So you can x plus tangent x. So we're just picking the denominator and hoping that that u substitution is going to work out. So what's the derivative of secant? Secant tangent. So our derivative is sec x tan x. And what's the derivative of tangent x? Secant squared x. And it would be improper to just write the dx here, because the whole thing is multiplied by dx. So you really need to write dx times that entire expression. Now, this is a perfect u substitution. I could use my favorite f word and factor. And I'm going to factor out a secant. They both have a secant. Now it should be a little more clear why this is a perfect u substitution. So this du is basically the entire numerator right here. That entire numerator is now du. So any questions on that uh, of why that that's the perfect du right there? So we just got an entire numerator turns into du, and we got u on the bottom. So that's about as good as it's going to get for a u sub. And from here, it's pretty much the exact same thing we did before. ln u plus c, and then unsubstitute for u. So everything we did was very easy, except for why in the world would I multiply by this term right here? Uh, and the short answer to that is because somebody who's done way too much trigonometry uh, realized that when you happen to multiply by this, it's the perfect u substitution. So if you've been spending a long time doing trig derivatives, this is something you may stumble across at some point. So I'm not going to give you problems that you'd have to figure out some arbitrary thing to multiply by to make your u sub work out. So this particular problem, I wouldn't expect you to be able to compute this derivative by hand, because you'd have to know to multiply by that weird version of 1 right there. Um, at the end, we're going to summarize all the, uh, anti, the four trig antiderivatives. And we'll put the uh, sine and cosine in there, too, just for completeness. So it, after we do our next uh, antiderivative, we'll write down all four anti, all six antiderivatives of the trig functions. So our last one is cosecant. So you've seen these work out really similarly in pairs. So our tangent cotangent basically had the same solution, the same method of solution. This cosecant is going to have a really similar solution to secant. What do you think would be a good thing to multiply by? Obviously, it's going to be 1. So whatever I put in the numerator is going to be in the denominator. Anybody want to take a guess? Yeah, let's try cosecant plus cotangent. Basically pick the other corresponding trig functions and hope that it works out. So 
So I think you can finish this problem off. I'll give you a minute to do this one. It's going to be really similar to the last problem that we did. So you might be whispering to yourself or your neighbor, what's the derivative of cosecant, cotangent? <laughs> so here's, here's my advice. You need a cheat sheet. I allow you to have one. Basically bring it everywhere you're going to do math. So put it in your notebook for class. When you do your homeworks, have your same exact cheat sheet out because you want to know where everything is on your cheat sheet. The more you use it, the faster you're going to know where stuff is and you know when you're doing your homework you realize you may not have forgotten to write the derivative of cosecant and cotangent you may have written the other four trig derivatives and just left these off and right now you realize you have no idea what they are so what you don't want to do is get on your quiz realize you have no idea what these are what's that sure <laughs> All right, so cosecant is negative <laughs> cosecotan. They're really similar to the secant tangent derivatives, but they just basically get negatives. Cotangent is cosecant squared x. The cheat sheet, or is it handwritten cheat sheet, or is it you So your cheat sheet does need to be handwritten. Okay. No using a printer and printing it out. You can copy it off of a printout, but I do want it to be actually created by you. So I don't want photocopies. It's going to be handwritten. And this can be used on like quizzes? And you use it every, everything, quizzes, midterms, and I strongly recommend you have it out during class and while you're doing your homeworks, because that allows you to write stuff on that you don't know. You may forget that you didn't know it when you go to write your cheat sheet later. So I recommend always have it, and you're just constantly adding to it. And hopefully at some point you'll be able to start erasing stuff that you remember. Or else you just start writing really small, and one of the two <laughs> things happens. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I recommend you use something more sturdy, like a half of a folder or something, but it needs to be the regular paper size. So well, folders are a little bigger. I mean, <laughs> Nor uh, normally I would be strict about eight and a half by eleven, but whatever eight, they'll say nine by eleven and a half. I mean, it can be a tiny bit bigger, but I don't want you coming in here with like a legal size paper, so you get the extra three or four inches of paper at the bottom. So I just a regular size piece of paper. I'm sure at one of your houses you probably have a stack of printer paper that's way better than the printer paper we have on campus. Yeah, derivative of u. Okay. And so after you have 
you took the derivative in that second column and you kept writing in du as if like you wanted us to take like the derivative of the next one? Is that or do you want us to just erase du after we take the derivative? So um, this is basically my substitution area over here. And then when I actually make my substitution in the original uh, expression, that's what I'm keeping outside the box, basically. And then this is just because none of us remember derivatives over there. That's separate. <laughs> Not specific to this problem. I think to answer your question, I think he's just algebraically cleaning it up. He's not taking more derivatives as he adds more BUs. I think he's just cleaning up the right side of the equation. Yeah, below that line that I just drew, there's no, it's just algebra down there. Okay. Yeah, so I only took a derivative going from U to DU. That's all just making it fit in the substitution a lot easier. Okay. So I, and when I, when I do this, what I'm really doing is I'm solving for everything that I just put inside that orange box right there. So I'm solving for that expression. For everything that's basically not u is, needs to be du. Or in so this case, negative du. Seeing that we, that the, we always have the same type of uh, situation, can we just like, skip all these steps and just circle that top part and just plug it right in? You see what I'm talking about? Do a U sub in your head? We keep having this thing be our answer, like the previous one, and we do all of this to end up with this top part. Can we skip this part? Is it going to be the same in every problem and just plug that in? No, oh, no, U subs are going to appear. So these feel all almost identical for one. No, I mean, it seems kind of logical. You know? so, so these problems are chosen because we're using this antiderivative. So all these are set up so that u is in the denominator. And the numerator, whatever else is in the numerator, is going to cancel out to 1 du. So these problems are chosen in a very specific way, so they work out in this form okay. right here. So not all of the problems are going to be Oh, definitely not, no. OK, that's what I was wondering. Plenty of times u is not in the denominator. Okay. However, when u is in the denominator, generally it's going to turn into a natural log antiderivative. So when they feel like this, it's probably going to be a natural log. It's going to be the actual antiderivative rule you use. So this is what we're most likely going to see on the quiz, though? Not this week. Uh, not this week, yeah. I think Juan should teach for one day. <laughs> OK. I guess we'll see. Now, at some point, you may do enough antiderivatives that you can just look at this form right here and do all that work in your head. But I haven't done that many antiderivatives yet. I'm getting close on some of the other antiderivatives, but not like this type right here. Like I would, I would probably, if I tried it, I'd probably guarantee at least messed up the negative sign right. at a minimum. I'd probably mess plenty of other things up too. And maybe I put tangent instead of cotangent because I just forgot or something like that. So that's why, that's why you want to work through all the steps down there. So that's the end of the natural log section. So next we're going to go into exponential functions. So with exponential functions, what you learned about them before, you actually learned about exponential functions way before you learned about logarithm functions. And how are exponential functions related to log functions? They're kind of reciprocals. They're inverses, basically. So we just learned all about logs. What we're going to do now is define the exponential function to be the inverse of the log function which is defined, the log function is defined to be the 
vary under a curve of the 1 over t function. So everything is going to basically come back to that. So let's get started. So pretty much already know the definition. And I'll write it out precisely here. So e to the x function is ln inverse of x. And I know, I'm pretty sure I mentioned the inverse notation before. Negative first powers in function notation does not mean the reciprocal function. So that's only true if you got a number and you're looking at a negative first power and a number. But functions are not numbers. So this is referring to the opposite function or the inverse function. So that's the definition. So let's look at, let's start off with limits first. If that was log base anything else, would it be like the base number of the x instead of e? Or? Well, that's a good question. We'll get there eventually. So yeah, we're definitely going to use bases that are not just e, or nat the natural base. Well, now you finally know why it's called the natural base. It's the number that makes the natural log equal to 1. So that's why they call it the natural base. So we'll look for the limits of, of ln inverse. So I think probably the best thing to do is Let's write down, draw out the graph real quick of ln, and then we'll invert the graph. So we'll swap x and y axis and reflect that graph over. So I'll draw the uh, ln function really quickly in green here, just doing a rough sketch. So our vertical asymptote, x equals 0. Our only intercept is at 1, 0. So we're going to take this function and I better label it. This is y equals ln x. So we're going to reflect it across the line y equals x. So I spent a lot more time graphing in pre-calculus one class with these ideas. But basically, your inverse graph, you're just sw swapping the role of x and y. So the easiest thing to do is if you know points, you're, I'm just rewriting that zero, uh, 1, 0 point. I'm swapping x and y. So it becomes 0, 1. And what happens to our vertical asymptote, x equals 0, if I reflect it across the blue line right down the middle of the graph? So it'll, so it'll turn into another line, but what line does this, so it'll turn into the y equals 0 line. So it's going to go and get reflected, and it's going to reflect into a horizontal line. Uh, another way to think about it, reflections are hard to think about. So another way to think about it is if you're r roasting something and you rotate it halfway around. So that's like your skewer, and you want to burn it, so you rotate it halfway around. So you cook the other side. It may be easier to think about flipping it over. You can literally hold up your paper to the light and look through it and kind of very carefully turn it over like that. I can't, I don't think I can do that with this. Maybe there's some fancy thing I could do with the graphics. I think they let you rotate gra the video, but they don't let you reflect it. I haven't seen that, that option yet. So I don't think I can do that. Uh, so just think about, we're going to basically reflect the curve or rotate around that y equals x. So that x equals 0 line, when it rotates around, it's going to turn into y equals 0. I didn't need to draw x equals 0 out of the top up here. 
So I'm only going to redraw basically the negative part of the x equals 0. So that'll be the negative part, or the y equals 0 line going to the left. And now if you have some good visual drawing skills, you can probably redraw the mirror image. It's going to look about like this right here. So we're just reflecting that green line across the blue line right there. So any questions on the way that that's drawn? So this is y equals ln inverse of x, which we could also write as y equals e to the x. And I think in pre-calculus class, we learned about exponential graphs before we learned about logs. So we actually graphed this black curve out before we even talked about logs. So this was, and we graphed it with the clueless method where we just pick points. We chose a base like two or three and just pick like five points and connected them together with a line, or with a curve, I should say. All right, so now we can look at this curve and answer questions about the limits. So what is a limit of ln inverse x when x approaches negative infinity? So we're looking at the left end behavior over here. So what happens when x gets uh, further and further to the left? What y value are we approaching? Zero. zero. So we're just looking when x goes to the left, we're approaching zero. And we're going to go all the way to positive infinity now. What y value do we approach when x is going to the right? So we're going up and up, so we're going to infinity, positive infinity. So those are our two limits. This right here is very, the definition is very useful and very important. So I'm going to interchangeably write e to the x and ln inverse of x. They're the same thing. So just depending on what I feel like writing, I'll write one or the other. There'll be certain times where it's way uh, more clear to use ln inverse than it is to use e to the x. So we'll look for uh, some algebra, algebraic properties. So our first one, we'll look at what is e to the ln of x. So you might have remembered this from pre-calculus class. Anybody remember what this reduces to? All right, so let's pretend that you didn't remember what it is. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to use the definition of e to the x. So what is e? e is ln inverse of that ln x. So that's just what e to the x means. It's the inverse log of the input, which is ln x. So what is ln inverse of ln of x? Not quite 1. No? It's going to be x. So the function inverse of the function, the functions cancel each other out. So they're basically, if you were to using you know, canceling notation, you would cross out the functions, not the x itself. So they're going to cancel out and give us x. So before, I basically just told you e to the ln x equals x. But now you know the reason it is because ln uh, is the inverse function of the exponential function. So we're going to do the same thing here, ln of e to the x. I'm going to use the uh, ln inverse notation for the exponential. 
And now we have ln of ln inverse. And those are going to cancel each other out, and we're left with just x. So if I summarize them, put them in one box without the middleman, and that's what we get. So next up, we'll take a derivative. Now if I just asked you directly, find this derivative, what's the only thing you really know about e to the x right now? You know some stuff about the limits and some algebraic properties, but you don't really know any calculus properties. So if, if I asked you to take this derivative, the best you could really do at this point is write it as ln inverse x, and then use the inverse derivative formula. Uh, so you could do it that way. We're going to actually do it in an easier way. So it could be done this way, but we're going to do it in, in a different way. So let's forget that. There's actually a way easier way to get this. The reason we're going to compute this derivative we just showed that ln of e to the x equals x. So this is the same as the derivative of x. So I want you to use the chain rule on the left side. You can only go so far because you're going to have to leave it as derivative e to the x. We will, but we're going to do it in a roundabout way. So the way I crossed out is absolutely a way to do it. But we're going to do it in a way easier way. So the chain rule says derivative ln of that stuff is 1 over the stuff multiplied by the derivative of e to the x equals derivative of x is 1. So what I'm going to do is solve for the derivative e to the x by multiplying both sides by e to the x. Which is probably the easiest calculus problem we'll do all quarter. There really wasn't much going on beyond the chain rule here. So it's the only function, aside from the function that's always 0, it's the only other function whose derivative is itself. Every other function has a derivative that's not itself. And of course, every derivative, we get a free antiderivative. So the antiderivative we get, we're going to move the derivative to the other side which is very exciting here. So this is e to the x equals antiderivative e to the x dx. We do need a plus c. And I'm going to switch the variable to u. So there's our free antiderivative that we get. Now pretty much whatever I put in a box is a uh, good idea to either memorize or put on your cheat sheet. Now this derivative is pretty easy. You probably want this on your cheat sheet for a little while, but at some point you're going to know that derivative e to the x is itself, and you won't need it on your cheat sheet anymore. So this is one of the ones that's pretty easy to remember. And it's a good place to stop. <laughs>